You perhaps remember the headlines uh, of a year or so past of 52 people dying mysteriously at the Veterans Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Well, this book, and the author with me, is about that incredible mystery which still exists today, and two Filipino nurses are on trial, I guess. Bob Wilcox, former Miami News reporter, welcome. The, are they on trial yet? or what? Yeah, they're, uh, we're in the uh, fifth or sixth week of the trial. Uh, there's a week's break. Uh, that's why I'm back here. Uh, Basically, the story is 52 people died unex unexplained, respiratory failure or whatever. Well, uh, not 52 died. Oh. Uh, 52 uh, mysterious breathing arrests uh, in a period of a month and a half. Uh, normally, the hospital would have had 12 arrests that is a breathing failure that they could have explained. Mm -hmm. These were over 50 they couldn't explain. So you've got eight to 10 times, well, eight times more than normal. Uh, the amount of deaths uh, is between 10 and 20. Nobody knows. I tend to go towards the 20. Two nurses are charged, and what do the charges say they did? Well, they, they are charged with murdering two patients and poisoning nine, which amounts to, this is the amount of, uh, of victims that the government could muster a case on. Right. Uh, there are many, many problems in saying a guy was, was, right. um, was attacked. How do they claim they were murdered? Okay, uh, they say that the nurses uh, came to their rooms and injected pavulon, a muscle relaxer, which causes paralysis of your entire body. You can't move a muscle after a few seconds, including your breathing muscles. This is only used in surgery. Uh, when, you're, when, you, when you're on a breathing machine, they'll give you this so that when they cut your stomach open and they're working on your gizzard, you don't cough or something and, you know, jar the man. Right. Right. So uh, the allegation is that they uh, came in and uh, uh, injected the IV tubing, which is the, the common method of injection. You don't really, when you're in a the hospital, they don't give it to you in your body. They give right. it to you in your IV tubing. It's faster. And that uh, injected them with pavulon and that breathing arrest or, or failure followed within seconds. And uh, may I now describe what happens to yes. you when you do this? Uh, you uh, have about, uh, I don't know, between 15 and 45 seconds before suddenly something's going wrong inside of you, maybe a ringing in your ears. You might have a moment to raise up. Then you fall back limp, your eyes close. Uh, some of the victims have described their eyes uh, going one way and the other the other way because you lose all muscle control. You fall back down, you can't even move a little finger, and yet you're fully conscious. You can hear people around you, uh, you, can, uh, you, you can think, you can feel pain. You're like a man in a uh, buried alive in a casket. Mm. And if you're in the ICU where you're monitored, great. Uh, they'll probably find you in time. They've got about two minutes before you begin to, s you're going to suffocate and you know it. You can just do nothing but wait and to suffocate. Mm -hmm. If you're in the ICU, they'll find you. If you're not, if you're off in this isolated wing, Unless somebody happens to walk in your room, you can't yell, you can't do anything. A funny thing was that nobody ever really saw their attacker until August 15th, a month and a half of this, 50 of these mysterious arrests. Somebody dying almost daily. And Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, it was one death per day uh, was, was the thing. Finally, on August 15th, the killer became so brazen that he came out of the night, so to speak. Or she. Or she or they. Yeah came out of the night, so to speak, since all of the uh, murders were occurring at nighttime, and attacked in broad daylight in the ICU in front of all of the heads of the hospital, who just happened to be there at that moment. Maybe, the, maybe that was part of the psyche of this thing. Bam, 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 one, two, three. Three mysterious arrests in a row. They were literally coming out of the woodwork trying to resuscitate these people. In the intensive care unit? In the intensive care unit. Well, the third victim, his name was John McCreary, he, when he was resuscitated, said, uh, he blew the whistle. He said, I saw this Filipino nurse come up to me with a syringe in her hand and stick it into my IV. And he, by the way, he wasn't sick. He was in there for a checkup. Uh, he was going to have heart surgery. They had him in intensive care to monitor him, but he was fine, like you and I, reading a Reader's Digest. He had had other injections, but at this moment, he was not scheduled for an injection. And he said, I saw her come up, stick it into the IV, and moments later, I had this failure and, yeah. and and I have him on tape uh, he's talking about how he felt he was dead he figured look I can't move a muscle I can hear them talking around me I must be dead this must be the way it is and he, he had sort of a resignation about it uh, they revived him uh, thank God and he is as you see an eyewitness to this however he died he died before the case came to trial and you really? can't cross-examine a dead man right. so he's not part of the evidence. The case really boils down to a circumstantial case. They had that one eyewitness on her 
And then they began to go back through all of the mysterious arrests. And they began to feel that she and another nurse were at more of those arrests, around those arrests, at the scene of the crime, many more times than anybody else was. And there was, at the beginning of this, um, a daytime arrest, they believe, which was an attack. And it so happened that the nurse who was pointed out by John McCreary happened to be working an overtime shift into the daytime on that one arrest. So that was the kind of circumstantial incriminating evidence. On the other side, uh, the defense will say that, look, those, this, these two nurses were the most highly trained in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in, in the whole hospital. Mm. They should be around these patients. Mm. Let me say that uh, I don't think that on the basis of what I've seen so far and what I know that they're going to get a conviction. Really? And I personally, uh, this is not uh, I'm telling you what's going on, I'm just saying my idea, yeah. I don't think they're guilty. And I, uh, there has been a new development in the case, uh, and it is this, that uh, a supervisor of those nurses, after they were arrested and charged, it turned out that she went insane, and of course she was insane before that, mm -hmm. she went into a mental asylum, and during her treatment, uh, she began to confess to these crimes. Now, uh, doctors in, in uh, mental hospitals all the time hear confessions. Uh, half the patients say they killed their own parents when the parents are still alive. Yeah. So they didn't think anything of it. And they still don't think that this confession is anything more than a collective guilt feeling because she was the supervisor rather than a personal thing. Mm. But this nurse, uh, who, who then she committed suicide. Her, she was so sick that she committed suicide. And I personally think that uh, there's your best suspect right there. Bob Wilcox, thank you. The book, uh, again, is called The Mysterious Deaths at Ann Arbor. Uh, and uh, may I remind you, truth is stranger than fiction. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. We'll be right back.